This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. What do we hope to gain out of this panel? Uh, I really wanted, we, we really set this up to try to get the audience, uh, allow the audience to have a chance to see the pros and cons of a constitutional convention as a solution to California problems. So we really wanted to see both sides of the issue. Thank you for uh, having me here today. Um, it's always an honor to uh, come up to UC Berkeley and visit with uh, folks like yourselves. Uh, I thought it was interesting today uh, listening to the conversation about the uh, myriad problems of California. And uh, I'm not up here to tell you uh, what precisely are the prescriptions uh, and policy remedies that California needs. I think you've already you know, heard a lot of proposals from Democrats and Republicans, from academics and so forth. But I want to pose to you a scenario that I predict to you will unfold. Uh, Sherry Bebitz Jaffe uh, made a comment about the Constitutional Convention, and she called it a circle dot, dot, dot. Um, and uh, I would say that she got it backwards. The circle dot, dot, dot is the endless conversation about California's problems without a realistic proposal for a solution to them and a way to get to that solution. What we will see, and here's my prediction, is that all of these proposals uh, will not be enacted. They will not be enacted because they cannot be enacted because of the problem, the straitjacket that the state is in. Uh, it is not about uh, the quality of the legislators. The legislators are of fine quality. It is not about their political party. They are fine political parties. The proof of that is that we have had numerous changes in political party, Democrat, Republican, and the governor. We had the Republican in charge of the legislature in the mid-90s. We've had various Democratic majorities. And believe me, they're great, intelligent, smart, sincere people of good faith and conscience. None of them can fix the problem because the constrictors on their action are so severe. These are constrictors created by both, in part them, but mostly by the voters, right? Over a generation, in some cases longer. So it's not about the legislators. They're good. We wish them well. The system is broken. And the same broken system will prevent, you name it, the open primary, the blanket primary, the term limit fix, the two-thirds budget, two-thirds tax, op split roll Prop 13, none of that can come about from within the legislature because of the two-thirds rule in making constitutional changes. You can't get to two-thirds. A. B. It also won't come about through the initiative process because the initiative process is confined to single-shot issues. You can't do all these issues at once. You have to do them initiative by initiative. And the evidence is myriad that fundamental changes get knocked off by the special interests who mobilize against them. They pick them off one by one. You have a few exceptions, but the exceptions prove the rule. C, this is unacceptable. It's unacceptable in so many ways I can't name them, but I'll tell you 
from a very uh, specific vantage point, mine, as essentially, you know, uh, not a representative, but an expression of the new majority in the state. Younger, more Latino, more Asian, more black, more immigrant, who is suffering the consequences of the dysfunctionality of the state. It's we that languish in the prisons, drop out of the schools, suffer from a, a permanent crisis in infrastructure and water, have less of a future, less opportunity, function, are functionally excluded from the UC system, more than the other demographics. It's we that don't get to enjoy what was the promise of California a generation ago. So from our perspective, we have to have change. And the notion that the initiative process and the legislative process for structural reasons can't get it done is the reason that I'm very involved with the Constitutional Convention uh, movement. Why does the Constitutional Convention, why is it the answer? Well, this is a calculated risk. If the legislature is able to fix the problems, I'll be the first one to go away. If the initiatives to uh, un unravel some of these knots are successful in June of next year, I'll be the first one to say go away. But you know what? I think I have a good bet here. I think I'm probably right that there's going to be another $20 billion or $30 billion deficit. I think I'm probably right that these excellent individuals we have in Sacramento and the you know, governor, who is a friend of mine, won't be able to fix it in any other way but a short-term fix and a late fix. And uh, so I think I've got a good bet here that, A, that there is a voter revolt brewing like we've seen in California, and that a constitutional convention is a better solution than anybody else has got in that it is doable. Why do I say it's doable? Well, the easy answer is we're up in over 70 percent in the polls. A, that's what you need. Second, uh, we, fig we figured out a way to do it in a limited way, cut out social issues uh, that are very polarizing and limit it to uh, governance issues, election issues, initiative reform issues, the core issues that are the cr at the core of the crisis of the state. And finally, uh, we think the problem, I think the problem that all of us face in thinking about these things is that we think old. We don't think about what could be the context of a constitutional convention, one in which you have uh, numerous stakeholders from throughout the state going through a thoughtful process separate from the influence of the lobby and special interests. Uh, that's the answer. A good friend of mine said, voters are counterintuitive. They will vote for the forest even if they oppose the trees. This is what we have with the initiative process. You single out a tree and you vote against it. But if you put a fix that's been deliberated on for a year, that has stakeholders from throughout the state who are both selected randomly and appointed by local elected officials, that's limited in scope, that addresses budget and revenue and election and initiative reform and term limits, the core issues, you have a better chance than any other uh, uh, effort to get it done, and you only need a 50 percent vote to get it done. In a nutshell, that's why I think we've got the uh, better mousetrap, if you will, for fixing the catastrophic state of affairs that we have in California. It's not perfect. It won't end the crisis utterly, but it will enable government to govern. It will enable the will of the voters to be expressed. It will enable uh, the solutions to be found, those that are not directly out of the Constitution of the Convention, by the uh, legislature and executive branch uh, away from the straitjacket that they're in now. Thank you. Okay, we'll turn to John Grubb. Um, thank you all for, for coming today. Um, Antonio, well, very well put. Um, it's been one of the pleasures of my life, uh, which isn't so long yet, 
Uh, but to be able to meet people like Antonio and, and actually everybody that's on the stage here um, through the Constitutional Convention uh, campaign that we're embarked upon. So I'll use um, my time quickly to tell you a little bit more about what we're proposing. Um, Antonio went very, through, very well through why we think a Constitutional Convention is the answer. And that's again, just to repeat it, there are three ways to get reform. You can do it through the legislature. Um, who, does, Anybody here think that the legislature is going to pass meaningful reform in the next year? Show of hands? Okay. So um, we kind of feel that way too. I'm assuming you're not being shy that you actually are expressing doubt on that. Um, how about the initiative process? Uh, do you know, anybody want to guess how many initiatives are going to be, are scheduled to be on the ballot right now in November of 2010? Just throw out a number, anybody, please. Ooh, very close, 59. 59 separate statewide initiatives. That, that doesn't talk about how many will be on in, in Alameda or in Berkeley uh, or wherever it is that you live. Um, that may help foment the voter revolt um, that we think people are feeling. And so uh, an answer can be a constitutional convention. So uh, I expect you may be thinking and you may hear today uh, that a constitutional convention is a very hard thing to do. <laughs> I've spent, I spent a year on this my, uh, so far, and I can tell you it is. Does that mean we shouldn't do it and we shouldn't try? Um, I think it's time that we try to do something very hard uh, to hold a constitutional convention. Um, as Antonio mentioned, we have done our polling, uh, and of voters, we have support above 70% right now. It doesn't matter what party people belong to. 70% of Republicans, 70% of Democrats. It's the old, it's the young, it's very weird. The pollsters are very confused about the support. People want this, high propensity voters, low propensity voters. Geography, it doesn't really matter. It's really something incredible. Uh, it may speak to a constitutional convention as a way to bring us together again. Um, so our proposal, we will be turning in ballot language uh, on Wednesday. Um, with a press conference there, and if anybody, any of you would like to come, please, please do come. Uh, we'll be right outside of the state capitol. Uh, we are limiting it to four areas. So this will be the areas of governance. This is budget, the elections, so that's elections in the initiative process, the state and local relationship, and trying to find a rebalancing of power there, uh, of power of policy and, and of purse, of money. Um, between uh, where the funding goes. And then government efficiency. Um, we have approximately 389 statewide boards, commissions, agencies, and departments. And they're so overlapping uh, that, that no one has responsibility for issues anymore. Um, and so we think we need to get at that and try and find a way to get some responsibility vested in a smaller number of agencies, boards, commissions, et cetera. Um, who's going to be in the room? So here's the proposal. Um, you are going to be in the room. Uh, we are going to be calling on the citizens of California as a little more than half of the delegates. So we are proposing to, here's the term, randomly select three people from each assembly district. Okay? Um, we intend to pay them the same as legislators receive right now which is almost $116,000 a year. Let me ask a question. If you received this, uh, maybe you can call it a golden ticket, or this thing in the mail that offered you that, and you'd need to spend about six months to a year working on this, who here would be willing to serve as a delegate to the Constitutional Convention? Can I see a show of hands? OK. <laughs> that looks pretty good. That looks like a lot of people. And that's what we see when we've been doing these town halls uh, across the state. The other. <laughs> well, you get to serve too. That's the beauty of this. So the other half of the room, so it's about 240 people, uh, are, are everyday Californians. The rest of them would be appointed folks, and it would be appointed by a combination of local government leaders. So these would be two county supervisors, two mayors from each county, and a school board member. Uh, and then they would have an open hearing process. People would apply to serve and then they would pick amongst them to try and get a mixture in a constitutional convention of everyday America, uh, Californian values and then expertise and experience. And those, that, those experts, if you will, are not going to be of the same ideology. 
So they're going to have to convince these, the, the, the people, um, the, the everyday Californians, to support their different policy solutions. That's a moderating force on what they're going to propose. Um, this, uh, if, if successful, this would be on the November 2010 ballot. Uh, the convention would start in the early part of 2011, uh, and then it should wrap up by the end of 2011, and then we would have to vote on whatever reforms they propose um, in 2012, and they can schedule it in February, June, or November uh, of that, most likely heading for uh, the November 2012 ballot. Um, and then I'll, I'll stop there, and thank you again for the opportunity to be here. Thank you very much. Tim, we pass it to you. Well, I thought the uh, perhaps the most useful thing I could do up here is to recap a conference that uh, uh, Stanford University and IGS here at Cal and the uh, uh, Sacramento State put together last week. Uh, if you want to see the entire thing, you can go to the California Channel website uh, and uh, you can watch all of us, uh, you know, do our stuff. Uh, some of the material is also going to be on the IGS website within a week or so. Now, the purpose of that conference was the same as today, is to not proselytize, not do missionary work, but rather analyze. Um, and in organizing my thoughts about it, I, I was really struck with our third panel, uh, which maybe we should have had first, and that was we had experts from New York in the New York, last time there was a New York Constitutional Convention, uh, Illinois Constitutional Convention, and Alan Tarr, who is a director of the Center for State Constitutional Studies at Rutgers, uh, as well as an expert from the British Columbia Citizens Assembly that we've heard so much about in the last few years. The bottom line from their remarks is that it is extremely difficult to carry off a successful constitutional convention. In fact, Alan Tarr made the point that there were no experts in the room for any successful 21st century conventions because there haven't been any. In fact, the last successful one was in, I think, the 1970s or so. 90s. 90s. Um, what their lessons were was there has to be a general consensus before the convention as to what the problem is and what the solution is going to be. There needs to be a very strong consensus among delegates so that the end result, the new constitution, is supported by not just 51 percent but the overwhelming majority of delegates and the opposition is mild and weak. Uh, there needs to be a consensus among the electorate to support this and that means that delegates have to be willing to negotiate and compromise. When these things aren't there, conventions fail. Now, all of this requires very careful preparation and planning. Uh, Richard Temple, who's a campaign consultant, echoed this by saying, think long and hard during the front end of the process because the ultimate campaign to ratify the new Constitution will depend in large part on how the reformers establish trust and credibility of their process. So a lot of work beforehand, a lot of consensus doesn't work otherwise. Uh, they also noted the absolute necessity, particularly in British Columbia, where it was a citizen random drawing, of taking time to educate the delegates and not just throwing them into a convention all of a sudden. And I must add that in the Q&A at that panel, a question arose about what's the good size and mentioned that, that the, the, the pro proposals floating in California were about 400, and I have to report to you that all four panelists were surprised and concerned that that was too big of a number that was fairly unwieldy. Now, we also had a panel that I won't talk about too much because it was basically a recap of Jack Citron's uh, uh, panel this morning. Uh, I will say that according to the Field Institute poll, uh, asking different ways of reform that the support for a constitutional convention was 52 percent. Um, we also had a panel of legal experts uh, which, surprisingly enough, given that there were lawyers, did not argue too much among themselves. Um, and their consensus was that on the question of whether or not you could, draw, you could call a convention by a series of initiatives, uh, we have a provision in the Constitution today that says how a convention is to be, is to be uh, done. It does not provide calling a convention by initiative. So Bay Area Council is two initiatives, if I'm getting this right. One, to amend the Constitution to allow calling a convention by the initiative, and then the second initiative would call the Constitutional Convention. Our legal experts said there was, uh, it's debatable, but there are stronger arguments on the side that you, may, you can do it this way, 
but not so strong that would preclude litigation. Um, they also talked about the idea of a limited call, and there was a clear consensus, and the case law is supportive of this, that you can absolutely call a convention for a limited set of, of objectives, limited set of topics. The $64 question is, having called it for a limited purpose, can you keep it limited? And that is very, very much more problematic, uh, not just because, as, as Sherry Beppich Jeffrey said, the town hall meeting uh, syndrome, but more importantly, the granddaddy of all examples is the Federal Constitutional Convention of 1787, which was convened by Congress and specifically told not to adopt a new constitution, but just tinker with the Articles of Confederation. Moreover, there are st a string of state Supreme Court cases dealing with convention state constitutional conventions that ran away, and three of the four said, hey, once you're convened, they can do anything they damn well want to do. Right. Now, questions were also raised by the lawyers in terms of the equal protection uh, clause of the federal constitution, the Voting Rights Act, uh, particularly would be triggered by the fact that the, the current constitutional provision says that delegates are to be elected. This would change that to being appointed or randomly selected. I don't have any problem with that, but the Voting Rights Act says that if you change an elected position to an appointed position, then you have to demonstrate to the Civil Rights Division, the Voting Rights Division of the Department of Justice or the Federal District Court in D.C. that people of color, communities that are protected in the Voting Rights Act are going to have just as good a chance of being appointed, selected, as being elected. A randomly drawn thing, that would probably work, except that scientific sample, if you say we're going to do this to make sure there are 10 percent African Americans and 32 percent Latinos, you may run up against equal protection problems and therefore litigation. I'm not a lawyer. I don't know. Um, the lesson on historians, uh, and we have one of our participants from there here, was that if I could summarize it, it would be the law of unanticipated consequences. The progressives didn't have a convention, but they did a series of, of fundamental changes. Um, and they were surprised to find out that the tools, the initiative referendum recall that they thought would never be used by uh, corporations or partisan interests were immediately used by partisan interest. And, and one of my favorite things is the second recall in the state of, in the state of, of California was against a stalwart progressive who represented the Tenderloin in San Francisco, and it was also a strong supporter of prohibition. Uh, and his constituents, the bar keepers and the brothel keepers and the saloon keepers of the Tenderloin, recalled them to the shock of the progressives who thought that this tool would never be used against them. The 1879 Constitutional Convention was, as we've heard this morning, was brought a lot in, it was, was, it was uh, sparked by a lot of dissatisfaction with uh, the railroads and corporations and what have you. Most historians look at that and say most of what was accomplished was very little, except in the inclusion of very racist Asian exclusion language in the Constitution. So let me finish real quickly by saying I think that not the Bay Area Council, but I want to finish on this note. I think there is in many of these discussions and, and not John Grubb uh, and not Antonio, but I think there is a very dangerous and invidious disdain for elected officials. Generally speaking, there's too many reform groups, and I would say the people who got, no offense to League of Women Voters, but a lot of the people behind Prop 11 had this. Look at the criteria that you have to go through to be a member of the redistricting commission. If you are a community activist in Albany or Berkeley, great, you're a noble person. Let you decide that you want to run for school board or your city council and your scumbag that shouldn't ever be allowed near a constitutional convention or a redistricting commission. And that's absurd. And I would certainly hope that in doing the convention that there is nothing in there that says because you've committed the sin of being elected by your fellow citizens that you're ineligible. Thank you. Okay, Roger. Um, let, let's start off. I'm, my, my, the bottom line to what I'm going to say to you is that I think a constitutional convention is a great idea that won't work. I will happily vote for it come next November, but I'm going to explain to you what I see as the problem. And I don't, and I hate to be 
negative because I actually don't see any way out of the fix. And here, here's the essence of the problem. Uh, you have heard a litany of the nature of the problem today. Uh, I want to give you a somewhat different spin on it. The normal way a legislature and the governor do business in a normal world is a world of trade-offs and bargaining and compromises. I want a little more of this, so I give you a little more of that. Uh, and that process leads inevitably to some sort of centrist outcome. And that's the way we sort of all conceptualize the process to be. We have lived in a state where for all, at the entire lifetime of everyone in this room, we have gradually eroded the ability of the state legislature and the governor to engage in that process by a series of ballot initiatives. And what do ballot initiatives do? They change the nature of a policy debate from being about trade-offs and compromises to being about entitlements and rights. That is to say, my policy position on a particular issue, if I favor a ballot initiative, doesn't just be one more position that is subject to trade-offs and compromises. It becomes an entitlement, a right, that nobody can take away from me. And each one of these is also governed by the constitutional provisions about revisions versus amendments. And so what we get is things that can be profound in their impact, but they tend to be on a specific thing. They'll, they'll do a very specific thing. Sometimes they'll do two or three things, but if they get too far beyond one or two things, uh, the Supreme Court will declare that they're a revision instead of an amendment and, and nullify them. But the cumulative effect of decade after decade of initiatives about the budget process, of decade after decade of initiatives about the electoral process, is that in order to undo or change the cumulative impact, you're in revision land instead of amendment land. All right? That is to say, if I want to th conceptualize how I might take the entire budgetary process with all of the expenditure requirements built into it through constitutional amendments and all of the taxation constraints uh, through ta constitutional amendments, I can't systemically attack it as a system-wide problem without it being a revision. Now, that explains why a lot of people, including me, are sympathetic to the idea of a constitutional convention, because it's not realistic to imagine an initiative process, whether a legislative initiative or uh, a citizen's initiative, to, on the in the first instance, have enough resources to be able to solve a systemic problem and put it on the ballot and then convince two-thirds of the people to vote for it. That's not realistic, all right? So a more likely scenario, uh, obviously, than that, even though it has a low probability, is that you can call a constitutional convention and do a systemic fix in an easier way. That's the, that's the attraction of it. The, the, but the problem of it is precisely of the same nature of a systemic fix. Once it becomes apparent that people's things they perceive as their entitlements are now subject to trade-offs, we're going to be subject to the same problem that gave us the initiatives in the first place. People will say, well, in general, this would be a good idea, but they put my favorite thing in the box. It wasn't excluded, and I'm threatened. My favorite little initiative out there that I regard as terribly important to me, maybe in a purely economic sense, it creates a protected wealth position for me. It gives me a right to make money in a way that I wouldn't otherwise be able to do. It protects me against the competition. Maybe it's purely an expenditure policy, that I get more of a particular public policy than I otherwise would, that's protected against, against other people nibbling at it to spend the money on something else. And people are going to respond to the proposal, I think, in precisely the same way. They would respond to the direct attack specifically on that initiative. That's why I suspect that a uh, pre pre preliminary necessity to getting a constitutional convention call initiative passed, I, I think, I'm not sure of this, 
is, a, is to do something like Thad Kauser was proposing earlier, is to fix the initiative process first by, and I would say I would add one thing to Thad's list, that in addition to the uh, all initiatives should have the rule they have to be uh, budget neutral. That is to say, there has to be a combination of new taxes plus expenditure reductions in every initiative uh, to finance it. In addition to that, they also have to have a sunset clause. Uh, the Jeffersonian idea that no one should have to live under a constitution written by his parents. Um, and that idea strikes me as making it more likely we could get a constitutional uh, uh, convention. Now let's assume I'm wrong and assume we actually have a constitutional convention. Now Tim and I have, have come up with a, a brilliant way, you know, this thing is going to cost a lot of money, but we know how to pay for it. Because both of us started off the conversation by saying, you know, we think it's going to be chaotic and not, probably not going to work, but boy, we'd be willing to buy tickets. And, and then t he came up with the wonderful, even better idea, this would be a great reality TV show. And, <laughs> So, you know, it'll cost $100 million or so to pull this thing off, but I bet we can get that from NBC. <laughs> Fox. <laughs> or, or Fox, that's right. <laughs> but let, let's just go through the process. We now have a room full of over 400 people. Uh, how long will it take them to assemble? Uh, I'll, I'll give you the, the example of the California Institute for Re Regenerative Medicine, which is another thing that I was a strong proponent of. It took it almost three years to get started because of all the lawsuits against it that were basically baseless. And by the time it finally was up and running, we had a new president who'd, who had eliminated the restriction on NIH, on NIH funding. So there's that first problem. 2012, really unlikely. But then when we finally get to the end result, assume that the limitations work and assume that all of our, be our hopeful instincts about deliberative democracy come to fruition and this body of 400 and, and some people manages with a very large majority to come up with a really good structure. Once again, they have to get it passed. And once again, it's gonna gore all the oxes that have already gotten their initiatives into the Constitution and who will fight like hell to prevent them from being taken away. And I don't know what the solution to that is. Uh, I think the solution is a lot of public debate and I'll, uh, I, I shouldn't say that's a solution. The unnecessary condition for it all to work is an enormous amount of public debate and attention from the press that I don't think will happen. And so I'm skeptical. Thanks, Roger. So we pass it now to Nancy. Thank you. Well, I really appreciate the um, previous speaker's comments because uh, I think that the accuracy of that it's with that we are facing structural problems versus problems of you know we could completely change who is in the legislature or who's the governor and we're going to still face many of the problems that all of us are frustrated with because of some of these structural impediments that and i'm going to say we whether you any of you as or me as individuals voted for these things we have the california voters have put them into place and the net result of them is a whole variety of things to uh, to have greatly limit the ability to do trade-offs and greatly uh, limit the powers even that the legislature has. So whether we um, like the legislature or not, uh, it, even if we say today love them, um, they wouldn't have the ability to fix this because of some of these structural problems. So there, I totally agree. So then, of course, the, the question before us is, is the, conven is the Constitutional Convention the answer then to fix that? Now, I do agree with, I think it was Antonio's comments, that um, we're not going to fix it by a single initiative, absolutely. And I also agree that if we look to the legislature alone, and it's not so much that I don't think we have the ability to get along, but because of so many of these other issues, like the requirement of having to have a two-thirds vote. So if, let's say, if one of our key reforms was to restore majority vote approval of a budget, well, if you're at any point in time, whether whatever party's in the minority, at that point in time, why are they going to vote to give up the thing that gives them 
the most power, right? So, I mean, people don't tend to vote against their self-interest. So that, that alone, the fact that you have to have two-thirds of the legislature vote to put something on the ballot will impede that. So, um, so I think Antonio's uh, assessment of why either it is going to be very difficult to do it by you know, single initiatives or by legislative vote is accurate. But let's return again. Is the Constitutional Convention the way? Now, um, we also fortunately had a couple of uh, speakers clarify for you exactly what it says in our Constitution, meaning in our California Constitution, as to how a Constitutional Convention is convened. And the specific is that it is supposed to be established by a two-thirds vote of the legislature, not by initiative. Now, maybe we'd still succeed in court if we did it by initiative instead and that its participants, its, its, uh, you know, the people in the convention would be elected. So we now have the Bay Area Council wanting to put forward, no, they would instead be appointed. So I would guarantee that if the, the initiative that the Bay Area Council has in mind was able to be put on the ballot, and if it did pass, it will be thrown in court right away. And it will be thrown in court by multiple parties on multiple <laughs> issues. Um, it might still succeed. But so then I, I step back and I say, I feel, my, personally, I feel that we should engage in some more statewide dialogue. I think events like this, I think the fact that the Bay Area Council has been so vociferous about this and talking up and down the state, that the group California Forward has, that there have been uh, um, events like that which Sacramento State and UC and others participated in in Sacramento just a couple of days ago, I feel, and of course we have to have even more of those because we want, we, you know, a, an event like this on a university campus, so, you know, draws a certain audience. But I feel like we should uh, engage League of Women Voters, uh, entities like Barrier Council, our educational institutions, as many diverse entities as possible engage in discussing this question because I absolutely agree with, I think it was John's point, or maybe it was Timothy's, I'm not, that if we move to a constitutional convention, it is going to be greatly aided by the dialogue having occurred up and down the state to getting, so that we as voters, we as the people of California have a better sense of what it is we'd want it to achieve. And I feel like now we're at the place where some of the proponents have a sense, and I'm not saying that they're prescribing the outcome, they're not, but they have a sense, but the public hasn't engaged in that enough yet. And so if we have it, if, if we launch into it right now, I'm afraid it might be doomed for failure. And I also am a little fearful of 400 um, because, I mean, if we take it, those of you who took statistics, you know, you can, a 200 random sample is, 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 can be as, as representative as a 400. And I, I don't know what the magic number is, but I'm sure there is uh, analysis that could tell us what is, you know, the appropriate type of number that's going to be able to have to to you know, better engage in this kind of process. That number is huge. That's a very hard, um, so I'm, I'm, I am concerned about that. And I think that we need to get engaged in some more statewide dialogue. And I think in the meantime, and you know, whether this could be viewed as uh, self-serving or not, I think that we would be well served, we as Californians, if we were to put on the ballot and if we were successful at two, maybe three fixes, just as an interim. It's not to say that we would address, that that would solve everything, it wouldn't. But as we are engaged in the debate around constitutional convention, I think we would be well served by three things being fixed in the interim. One being the in initiative process. I totally support that we have a, that we approve that all initiatives must be revenue neutral that they would have to have, because I think one of the reasons we're in a structural deficit right now is the fact that we have passed so many mandates without putting a revenue attached to them. And so we are now, we expect, we as voters have demanded that the state provide 
you know, a whole host of things for which we have not indicated what we, how we would pay for it. And then we have this, you know, problem of not being able to generate the revenue to do so. So that's one of our structural deficits. And I think that the initiative process fix would be an interim measure that would be extraordinarily helpful. I think the other measure that would be extraordinarily helpful is the correction to allow localities to approve revenues by, I would prefer 50% by majority, but if it was 55, that was fine with me because we're seeing up and down the state the ability of local communities who want to support their schools, support their libraries, do any number of things, being frozen out by, you know, a half a percent or one percent of voters, to, that's what they miss that two-thirds by. So I think we would be extraordinarily served by that, and I think we would be extraordinarily served by restoring majority vote approval to the budget process in our capital as every other state but Arkansas and Rhode Island have. And if we look at all of us, all the other governing bodies that we are around, whether it's a city council, a school board, a county board of supervisors, they all have the ability to approve their budgets by majority vote. And we all have the ability to elect any of them by majority vote. So I think we really do need to restore that. And if we have those three, then we have a little more time. Um, they're not going to solve everything, but we have a little more time to engage in a longer dialogue around this constitutional convention and to, you know, try to move more towards a, a kind of, I'm not saying that you're going to get consensus in California, of course you aren't, but at least you'd have a, a kind of better understanding amongst, you know, do, do the residents of California, like I believe in my heart of hearts, want our educational system restored to the quality that it was? You know, and, and if, if that evolved as part of a primary thing that Californians believed in, then it would emerge in the Constitutional Convention as a priority. But if we force the Constitutional Convention too fast, those things might not emerge. Thank you very much, Nancy. I'm going to suggest that we now take uh, questions from the audience, and, but do it a little bit differently than we did in previous uh, sessions. Uh, I'm going to suggest we take five or six questions uh, solicit five or six questions, and then we let the audience each spend about a minute addressing which ones they... they. Gentlemen in the back. Uh, yes. Yes, you, sir. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this question is addressed to Antonio and John. Um, one, it's actually two questions, but very brief. Uh, one is, uh, can the state wait till 2012, given the dire situation? Our finances and structure is in now? That's question number one. Question number two is, there seems to be not overt tension, but the possibility of some conflict with the, the folks at California Forward. Uh, I understand, in fact, that they're planning to have a press conference also next week to announce their initiatives for the 2010 November ballot, uh, just at the time when uh, your uh, measure will be ap appearing on the ballot. Now, uh, one might be considered as an uh, inside game, and the other one might be considered as a, uh, a more open kind of situation, that is the convention. But I, I just wonder and question whether um, th these two groups, both of which are, uh, have high aims and high ambitions and to be, are to be lauded for what they're doing, may come into conflict with one another and will in effect, can fuse the voter. A couple more questions. Yes, sir. Right here. Um, I wanted to sort of follow up. Okay. I wanted to follow up a little bit on what Nancy said about uh, two problems. One is there's far too many people in the convention, and the second one, there's not enough of a sort of a revolutionary grassroots discussion beforehand. Um, a successful systemic thing was the federal runaway constitution because there had been an, a war of independence that did the revolutionary thing. And essentially people wanted a systemic thing so they proved the runaway co constitution within one year. I don't see that here, but I would like to have people address how they can see engaging the population in a uh, discussion process that's grassroots enough to get them excited and to break the hundreds of people, which is sort of Athenian jury, uh, impossible situation down into something that's more like a grand jury process of a couple dozen people who call on expert things, which is the education question, and essentially act as committees to make a workable but complex document. 
Okay. Uh, gentleman in the back, yeah. Uh, my question is mostly addressed to John Grubb on your explanation of how delegates are allocated, and it has to do with one man, one vote, and minority representation and participation issues in combination, and the difficulty of achieving the latter in any, any appointment scheme you come up with suggests that you're not going to have free open choice by each of the appointing bodies because you've got to make the total somewhat imbalance. I'm interested in that comment. The one, the one man, one vote issue stems from 66 in California and redoing the legislature and so on and making both houses subject to population. Yet the convention mechanism you suggest is part population or more or less with the assembly district appointments one can argue that's as close as we can get to one man, one vote, although uh, the census is a bit aging, so it doesn't represent today's population. But be that as it may, the other side of it is like the state senate before one man, one vote, except it's worse because you used to have the small rural counties represent one senate district. L.A. County only got one. As I did in you know, a rough estimate math, L.A. County would seem to get something like 30 percent or so, and its population is 40 percent, but Inyo County, which represents probably 0.001 pop percent of the state's population, gets something like 1.2 delegates. So the 20 largest, smallest counties, you know, the bottom from item number 39 county to 58, get about 20 percent of the delegates. That doesn't seem logical to me. So maybe you can explain that differently than I understand it. Mm. Thank you. Let's take a few more just because we'll give the panelists just one shot to, to answer. Yes, ma'am. Where does the money come from? The uh, Thank you. Where does the money come from to fund the proposed uh, equal to the legislators' uh, salaries? Salary. Okay. Good. Yes, ma'am. I just wanted to ask, why is a convention preferable to a constitutional revision commission? Hmm. Yeah. Any more? I'll take one, one or two more. It's just anybody else? Okay. So uh, two minutes each. Okay. Oh, boy. A <laughs> uh, lot of stuff to address. If I could give you... Um, a little bit of the internal feel in designing the uh, initiative, it might answer some of your questions. On the um, voting rights issues, uh, the Voting Rights Act is enshrined in the initiative language. We wanted to be very clear about our intentions to respect minority voting rights and to the extent possible within California law, promote diversity, ethnic uh, and gender diversity in the delegate selection on the one hand. This is all a balancing act. Uh, in terms of um, the uh, issue of, uh, again, on one man, one vote, that is a little bit why we sidestepped, in part, election of delegates. If you are, in essence, creating a commission, which is sort of like what we're doing, versus electing a convention, you don't have one man, one vote, uh, 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 stipulations, uh, and that was important to us. The other part in not having elected delegates was fear of special interests. We are all clear about the influence, inordinate influence of money in, in elections, special interest money in elections, and we didn't want to put that monkey on the back of uh, people running for delegates who were hopefully common and common people having uh, inf been influenced by special uh, interests. Therefore, the hybrid of uh, a randomly uh, selected uh, group of delegates from assembly districts, which are voting rights approved, right? These are the assembly districts that passed muster in the uh, last uh, redistricting, with the, which gets you the grassroots side uh, of it. You ha the weaknesses, you, ha you have to have the right list to draw from. And we're very, as a voting rights organization, we're very much on that as is common cause. With the need for experience, hence the uh, priority in having some of the delegates selected by uh, local elected officials, who, unlike Sacramento, 
are comparatively popular with the electorate. Right now, there's a lot of anger with Sacramento. We didn't create that, but it's something we took into account. Um, now, on, uh, on the notion of conflict with California Forward, in fact, we are a, a grantee of California Forward, my organization, the William C. Velasquez Institute, and I was part of the uh, team at, as a visiting scholar at the Packard Foundation, which helped design uh, California Forward. We uh, are fine with the voters having a menu of choices in November 2010 to pick from. Let democracy reign. It will be a big turnout election as November even year elections tend to be, comparatively speaking. And, uh, you know, if, uh, voters pick other reform measures over ours. Okay. You know, if, if they pick ours and if they pick theirs and ours, fine, because that'll mean some issues are off the table and resolved. We'll have less of a, a pressing mandate. If they reject theirs, uh, uh, and pick ours, uh, you know, it'll work out in my view. Uh, uh, so I think I got, uh, at least that's, I got some of them. That's my two minutes. <laughs> Antonio Handel, <coughs> we need to be on the speaking sure. circuit together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, do a great job. Um, so in terms of building- the Magic act. If, is that right? Okay, all right, well, maybe after the show. Uh, so uh, in terms of grassroots support, we have uh, more than a year before the election, and so that's going to be one of our challenges um, that we intend to, we have lots of challenges, as we've heard. Again, doesn't mean we shouldn't try. Um, uh, but building grassroots support is how we're going to have to do this uh, because the big money um, from big contributors is going to be on those 59 or whatever it boils down to, but on those ballot measures. There will be war going on um, on the California ballot between the usual suspects. Um, and so we're going to need support and money from grassroots to be able to do that, and we have a plan to try and get there. Um, and I would second uh, what was said about California Forward. Um, we speak with them every day almost uh, and work with them in concert. Uh, don't think of it, it's a false choice. Uh, that you have to support one or the other. You can support both, that's what we both say, uh, and I would hope that you could support uh, both of them. Um, constitutional Revision Commission, we are in some effect creating a Constitutional Revision Commission, but there was one in the 90s um, uh, that was appointed by Governor Pete Wilson. Uh, some very wise people were appointed to it. It had no power. Once it was done, they took their measures and they put them on the steps of the state capitol. Uh, and then nothing was done with them. And the, the strength of a constitutional convention is that it goes, whatever they propose, goes back on the ballot automatically. Um, so those reforms, you're still gathering that sort of uh, uh, group of people, a little bit different, but mainly like that, uh, and it goes on to the ballot, it has that additional strength. Um, so, yeah. Thanks, John. Tim? Um, Thanks, your, those though, what were, neither of them addressed the money issue. Sure, sure. Thank so, you. Uh, there, there have been uh, 232 uh, successful state constitutional conventions um, in U.S. history. By the way, they last on average 2.3 months. Um, it's a little bit different than we usually think of it. Um, there was a proposal for a constitutional convention in Hawaii uh, coming up, actually, and then last year in Illinois. Estimates are arranged around 20 to $23 million for those. We're estimating a cost of um, seven quarters per person. Um, and so basically $70 million for California. Um, that would be paid for uh, as a, as actually would be coming out of the Fair Political Practices Commission uh, and a sort of funding mechanism through them. Uh, but that's, uh, think about it in terms of budget delay. Um, uh, the 2008 budget delay was $40 million per day. Uh, and what was quoted by the Department of Finance was that the final delay cost $9 billion in budget delay. Um, so what we're asking may be a relative bargain uh, if we're able to, to fix these problems. Tim? Um, well, I should say that I think $70 million is, is, is budget dust you know, in a lot of ways. Um, it isn't something to be really concerned about in the context of a $80 billion budget. Uh, as a member of the Fair Political Practices Commission, I certainly hope that we get to keep that money forever. No, okay. Um, I guess the two things I would say is is the question of, of can the state wait? Um, you know, throughout the day, the, the, the three reforms that keep coming up again and again and again was redistricting reform, uh, open primary, some sort of blanket primary, 
um, and, and moderating the, the term limits. And there's a good chance that by November of 2010, we will have achieved all three of those. Okay? And I think that then will have some real impact. Um, the, you know, obviously I, I was a little, you know, I'm a little uh, agnostic, a little pessimistic about the convention, but in, in the sense of trying to give good advice, um, my particular concern is the idea of a runaway convention. I don't think the, the legal precedents are persuasive that it can't be run away, but let me suggest something. Adding, and I do this in all sincerity, adding the idea of government efficiency is a very good marketing tool. Right, particularly since the data we heard this morning is that 60 some percent of Californians think that most government money is wasted and you could cut billions without having to affect services. It's a good marketing tool. It is an open invitation to a runaway convention because those 300 and some agencies that would be dealt with include workers' compensation, stem cell research, early childhood development, licensing of everything from acupuncturists to x-ray technicians, environmental protection, worker safety, consumer protection, uh, coastal protection, Cal EPA, the implementation of AB 32, prisons, and the constitutional autonomy of the UC, which as a CSU employee, I'm not sure I completely can inhale, but <laughs> so. Just, uh, oh, yeah. I'm sorry, yeah. I'm no, go ahead, no, I'm, I'm through. I just, could I just respond yeah. to that really quickly? Um, uh, so it's not about getting rid of those functions of state government, that, that, that efficiency uh, mechanism. It's about trying to con maybe consolidate some of them. And there are commissions and boards that, uh, unfortunately, I don't have them in my head right now. Um, but if you heard about them, you'd think that's kind of silly that there's a state commission for that. I guess um, my, my point, John, would simply be that if you have a delegate in the convention and I stand up and say, I want to get rid of the California regenerative stem cell or at least bring it over here, yeah. then that creates a discussion not only of accountability, uh, government structure, but also should we be in the business of doing that? So I think it, it then opens up. Efficiency opens up all budget issues, and all social policy issues require budgetary expenditures, and therefore it brings them all in. I think that's uh, straightforward. I, uh, I'm sort of happy that that's the case, actually, because I don't see any reason, uh, in pr any principled reason, as opposed to a political reason, uh, to exclude anything. If you believe in a constitutional convention, you believe in a constitutional convention. You don't want to take some things off the table because you have a commitment to a democratic deliberative process. So I, I don't share the concern about it. What I think is the problem here is the uh, political issue it raises. It just, you just, uh, be, but following the same logic that Mr. Runaway and Mr. Who Cares About Runaway have the same logic. Think of all the people who are going to be against that because they see the same logic. Likewise, the, I'm not afraid. I, it doesn't bother me that all five adult residents of Alpine County get to be members of the Constitutional Convention. Uh, but it is going to be a source of litigation and delay, and it's going to be a source of attack. It, the people who don't want this, who live in Los Angeles County, are going to say, we have seven and a half million, and we get five, and Alpine County has 800, and they get five. What's, what's this all about? Now, I don't care because it doesn't bother me. Uh, but it's another reason people are going to pay money to advertise, they're have, gonna have an issue, and they're gonna advertise against it uh, on this ground, and then they're gonna sue if they lose. And it just, it's just bothered. I, that, that's the, the whole problem here is that it's really hard to see how you can get through all this maze without generating so much opposition that it becomes a hopeless enterprise. And that was an illuminating discussion. And so thank you very much.